everybody, and welcome to the Daily News at TSN underscore Marshes, where you can find me, Marshall Ferguson. I will be sitting on my couch, just like the rest of you, in week one of the CFL, watching as these teams get underway on the regular season. Mike Daly on the other side, of course, of the uh, Zoomer here for us on CFP at Daily News 8 is where you can find him on social media as well. Hello, Michael. Hey, no calls this week. You don't yeah. get the week one because they're saving you for later on in the season. It's honestly, it's one of those things where like I'm on the CFL and TSN team and it feels like they told me, I don't know, man, you got a hammy. We're going to keep you at home. And I'm like, no, I'm, full, <laughs> I'm fully healthy. What are you telling you? I'm good. I want to play. And they're like, mm, no, hamstrings. So, We're going to so be careful with this saving one. saving you? <laughs> I don't know. The run or your <laughs> practice roster? I, I hope so. I think I'm on PR right now, but. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see down the road as we get closer. But uh, no, it's going to be a lot of fun. Week one in the CFL. Thursday, it is Calgary against Montreal. That has the potential to be great. Is Bo Levi healthy? Is he going to be able to sling it all over the place like usual? Is Reggie Begleton and Kamar Jordan going to go crazy for him? Is Khadib Carey going to be the secret sauce? And is their offensive line actually going to protect Bo enough that he can actually throw the ball down the field? Uh, I think would be probably the most interesting question there in Calgary. And then for Montreal, they didn't name Vernon Adams Jr. the starter. And then they did. It was like this whole thing where Dave Naylor's like, why would Kari Jones not name Vernon Adams Jr. as the starter? And I was like, oh my goodness, why is he doing this? This like, don't create intrigue going into the week one with your starting quarterback. It's just asking for a disaster and media mess. And, and then the very next media availability, Kahari came out. And he's just like, yeah, he's our guy. He had a great camp. I was like, well, why don't you just say that the first time? Well, and that's always, it's such a weird thing. Like when you see these coaches come out and they have to say like, yes, Vernon Adams is our starter. And you have to say it because yeah. if you don't, that's the only question that you're going to get for the rest of, for the rest of time until you say, yes, yeah. he's our starter. Like it could be like, Hey, Dane Evans is our starter. Right. But nobody's questioning it, but you got to hear it. You got to hear it. Yes. Dane Evans it's is so our starter. It's so funny. It's like, Cause the dynamic I find to be, honestly hilarious is that if there is a team where you think you know who the starting quarterback is and you don't ask and you get to game day and then all of a sudden it's different the media is like what the hell is this so you have to ask the question just to hear the words come out of the coach's mouth putting it into actual existence that yes he is the starting quarterback and that's and it's like if you ask the question and you don't get the answer that you want. Like there's other times where somebody will be like, oh, it's actually interesting you ask that because we're going to play this guy. And the entire room is like, sorry, come again? Like, but there's, no, there's no surprise in the locker room. No. It's just, it's for, it's for like everybody knows who the starter was and you could probably tell after week one of training camp, right? But it's yeah. funny that you never get like, hey, uh, who's going to be the D tackle starter this year? <laughs> and then you just sit there and wait. No, everyone's like, ah, everybody else replaceable. Yeah, <laughs> but who's who's your starter? Who's your starter? <sighs> Talking quarterbacks again. I love it. it makes me so happy. Uh, start <laughs> your season. Make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, start your season off right with products from our partners at Fox Forty. Outfit your coaching staff with custom logoed Fox Forty whistles, gear, coaching boards, and more. Go to fox40shop.com and use the code CFP15 at checkout for fifteen percent off of your entire order. We do not have a quarterback on the show this week, but we have an incredibly interesting man. A man who negotiated his own contracts. One Justin Medlock was welcomed onto the pod here this week, Michael. Yeah, we got Money Med. And uh, it, it's funny that you say that because, you know, we dive into it a little bit with them, the, the, the negotiations. And I always found that such a weird thing because I had an agent the entire time I played. A lot of guys do. I think it's very rare that you see somebody that doesn't have an agent. Um, but for those that don't, Think about these conversations that they have to have with the GM. You have to go in and say, once free agency starts, or if you want an extension or whatever it might be, pay cut even, these are the conversations you have to sit in front of your GM and literally say who you're as good as in the, in the league. Say, okay, so, you know, for, in, in order for me, I'll, I'll give my example. Okay, so there's a backup safety over in Montreal, and he's making 90000 to play special teams and backup safety. And then there's another one that's in Saskatchewan and he's making 110,000. And I know I'm better than him, but he might have a little more playing under his belt. I know I'm better than the other guy. So maybe I should be somewhere in the 95 and the GM can sit there, look you in your eye and say, you're not as good as them. We're going to give you 75. 
And now to have that conversation and to decide if you're going to sign, if you're going to extend, if you pay cut, whatever it might be, and to sit there and then also go, okay, now let's go to practice. And this is what, and you're, you'll figure out your worth with an agent. But the weird thing is having that face-to-face conversation with the GM. That, that is a weird one. So here's my question to you as somebody who has experienced uh, at times those difficult conversations, but through the window of your agent. Either way, you're finding out. Yeah. But, you, but, but what you're saying is, I would rather have it go through the filter of my agent where I don't have to have somebody tell me to my face and find these things out. Whereas Medlock in our conversation is saying, tell me to my face. I don't care. I'm going to find out anyways. Let's just figure this thing out because I don't want to give some guy a cut just because he's willing to be this filter. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing, right? I think a lot of people can get away with being their own agents. They just have to be informed. The thing that an agent helps with that I found was the extra stuff that you would get onto your contract. When you're first coming in the league, to get certain bonuses, whether it's interception bonuses, special teams tackles bonuses, 51% playtime mm-hmm. bonuses, right? That's a big thing right now. Those type of things, when you're first coming in, you don't really know what's available, what's on the table. And if you don't ask, you don't get it, right? So where you have somebody with experience, I can get that extra stuff. But I was pretty sure at the end of my career, I could, I could negotiate my own contract. I've seen enough of them. I know how those conversations go. The nice thing is, though, is it's, you know, the GM could say to your agent, hey, uh, no, we're only going to give them 80. And you can just say, hey, listen, get me 90. I don't care how you do it. Get me 90. And then talk to me once you do. And then now they have those tough conversations in the back. And all you hear at the other end of it is, hey, okay, got you 90. Hmm. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> However, that ends up working out. But that's the nice thing. Now, the way Medlock's looking at it is now he has to have those penny pinching conversations to get an extra 10 20k whatever it might be right yeah it's funny hearing you say that too because i was watching the bc lions uh i think it's episode five of their arrow up series that they've been doing on on youtube and it was so well put together nick walski's out there doing all the video work for the bc lions now he does a tremendous job used to be with the manitoba bisons and did some great stuff in, in the province of manitoba and winnipeg but uh the players finding out that the CBA had been ratified as they're sitting in the ice tubs was such a great scene because it was like every dude had just like logged onto their iPhone at some point in the last 24 hours and responded to the email in the way that you detailed for us in a previous episode here of the daily news by saying yes or no. And then, you know, whatever, and it's out of their hands. And then it's just dudes walking around the facility going, are we playing? Do we have any news? Do we have any news? Do we have any news? Until eventually Tanner Dahl, the team rep just walks in to the training room. He's like, Hey, we're good. It's like, oh, it's it's, tomorrow. Yeah, oh, it's over. Like, and it's the same thing as you finding out. Like, it's out of your hands. The agent takes care of it and just walks in and goes, "Hey, ninety, we good?" And you're like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, sure, let's go." Yeah, and that's that's the coolest part is that you know. And then the other thing too, where an agent protects you a little bit, is some teams will reach out and offer you something, and if it's what people would deem disrespectful. And I don't think many contract offers are disrespectful because if the team's reaching out, that means they want you a little bit. It's just Mm -hmm. if you're getting your worth or not, but they'll protect you from that too. So if a team, you know, Mm -hmm. if I think I'm worth a hundred, hundred K a season, right. However that may shake out and a team comes at me with, okay, here, take 60. They won't even tell you. They'll be like, are you kidding me? No, we're not. We're not going to take that. So the conversation ends there instead of saying, Hey, just so you know, Edmonton thinks you're only 60,000 player. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's the minimum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> that's, so, that's breaking CBA regulations. I, I have to be better damn. than that. Yeah, they really don't like me, I guess, huh? <laughs> but they, uh, they protect you from that. Well, I would also like for your agent to, uh, to get on selling the daily news here because we're for sale putting it in this podcast right now. If you want to support Michael Daly's podcast, then you can do so. Contact Michael Daly at Daily News 8 on social media. Look at that beautiful smile on the other side. Listen to that dulcet tones. All the information he's giving you from a player perspective that you haven't heard before. If you want that, then you know where to reach out. 
There you go. Don't quit your day job, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Great salesman. Uh, all right, let's get to Justin Med. Like he would be proud of me uh, pinchy, uh, penny pinching and trying to get as much money as humanly possible because uh, he tells us in this interview that, yeah, he just tried to get as much money as he could when he was negotiating his own contracts. But uh, super interesting guy. We hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as we did having it with him. Justin Medlock, still CFL player? We're waiting. It might happen. Not officially retired? Let's find out more from the man himself. Justin Medlock. Listen, this is this is an exciting episode because you are officially the oldest person we've had on this, <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> and listen, I uh, I wanted to get you on here because when we were teammates, you were you were a good time in the locker room. I miss having you around, but I did want to make funny in front of everybody that listens to this because that's just how it goes with kickers. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess I'm the oldest, but I've seen some old, I don't know, there's some old bucks on your show. I've seen a couple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, D- Derek Dennis is 33. How do we stack up with Derek Dennis? Yeah. yeah well, tell him, tell him, Ed, how do we stack up with Derek Dennis? <laughs> 38, 38. You need like Chad Rempel on here. Yeah, yeah we'll get there. we're working that way. We're working that way. <laughs> but listen, I uh, I do want to open the show with uh, me saying that you are the reason I never wanted to become a holder. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the specific. This is a story because you are such a perfectionist at at your craft that when it would be training camp and Med would be looking for a new holder, right? He'd be scouring the team. And it was, it wasn't the special teams coach scouring the team. It was Med walking around this team looking for a holder. And when you would get out there and he'd start telling you exactly how you have to hold this ball off the snap? I was like, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. He is too precise. And did you have a lot of problems with that? Like oh, I mean, I had- initially when you came in? Yeah, I mean, especially when you're coming from, like, the NFL background. I mean, everybody's pretty solid, but you're, like, nitpicking just, like, very minor details, right? And then you come to the CFL and you're like, oh, nobody's nobody can hold. You know, it's just, like, put it on the ground and figure it out. But uh, luckily I got, you know, Tasker. But I remember I had Daniel Peterman. I, I remember from uh, Mac. He's one of the Mac boys. Uh, I threw a couple of balls to him, and I was like, yeah, um, yeah, this isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm gonna save you some time. You're good. You're good. You can go ahead and I'm into the showers, man. And I imagine that's how it happened for a lot of guys because a lot of people are like, "Hey, you know what? I can hold. How bad it begins to be?" And then yeah. Ben says, "Okay, yeah, come on out here." I think even Kenny Lawler tried. I, I think he was like, I'll do, "I'll do anything to get on the field." At that point, and then now he's like, "Oh no, I'm good. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> I don't want to do special teams." Yeah, as soon as you start getting paid two hundred thousand dollars to just be a receiver, you're like holding. No, I, that's not a thing that I do anymore. But I, I have to ask with Peterman because it's funny. I threw to him when I was playing at McMaster, and the thing about Dan is that his his hands are fantastic. Yeah. But it was but it was always yards after the catch, and he was always somebody. And you know this, and Mike knows this. He was always somebody who moved in slow motion. Was that what made him a bad holder? That from yeah, like, the, the catch more, to it putting it down. Just like- comprehending it was like compre- comprehension you know like reading comprehension you know it was like for, like i would just tell him something he just couldn't get it i'm like your hands your so brain what, what makes a great holder what what makes a great holder like what was the problem uh, with all of these people uh you can tell just right away from hands right so i mean luke it's, it's, he just caught the ball so smooth he was he was so good he was easy and then he was coachable right uh daily was coachable and he was solid but he was kind of like a third fourth option you know <laughs> just like hey if somebody gets hurt and then that person gets hurt then like daily maybe you know so <laughs> or we'll just uh, or we'll just drop kick it if we have to yeah yeah <laughs> actually i try to look for like the uh the canadian on the team or the backup quarterback and usually backup quarterbacks aren't as friendly to holding but sometimes they are who knows <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny man like because every other kicker that i've met isn't like you <laughs> like there's every other kick I met that is just like, eh, I don't know, just kind of get it down and angle it this way a little bit. But every other kick, everybody kind of like came after me, right? So I already groomed everybody. It was like Luke was already groomed <laughs> by the time like Sergio came. In. He was like, oh, this is perfect, this is amazing. And then Liar came. He was like. Oh yeah, just a little bit more lean, you know. But that looks good. Looks good. You know. I love. So I, I love the idea of like a new kicker walking into training camp day one. They're like, all right, special teams, let's go down here. And then Tasker just does it. And the kicker, like Sergio and Liram walk up. They're like, 
where did you learn that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lots everybody just come, nights. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you come from like the, the Medlock School holding, then you know, you know you're, you're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> God, kind of like, I, I, I want to make that a t-shirt so bad i think even like you know sean white i mean he probably doesn't give me props for this but it's okay um but i remember he was kind of struggling a little bit and then you know i kind of gave stala a couple tips and then he like went on the tear and from there he was career was upwards so you're the reason for sean white doing so uh, well i mean maybe just his holders getting a lot better <laughs> but i mean he was always a good kicker so can you can you give us quickly here justin the top five holders you've ever had because you just mentioned stella and i know sticky yeah. was like pretty off and on with it yeah. no, with that he, face? Was, he was not in the top five <laughs> okay would be, uh, luke would be number one yep uh I don't know, Jason Boltis was pretty good too. Wow, really? Yeah, he's pretty You good. are old. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right here. Kevin Ivan. Oh wow. Oh my god. Not really aging yourself over there. Yeah, he <laughs> coached me. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. Coach Coach Ivan. I mean, yeah. um, it's always weird when you start playing and you see Coach Shivers and oh, Coach yeah. Ivan. You just see the coaches, and then you see the head coach. And you're like, "Oh, hey, you're head coach. Oh, you're a GM now. Oh, yeah, I played with you." <laughs> I, actually, that's another thing I want to talk to you about because you are one of the only people that manage your own contract and talk yeah. to these GMs, and you are your own agent and stuff like that. And I love that idea. I never pulled it off because I was just yeah. like, "Ah, that's yeah, a lot of work." But what, like, did you ever run into some issues? I'd imagine, you know, anytime you had battles with Berkey or something like that, like that's a hard, that's a weird thing to do when you think about it. Cause it's like, you're kind of talking up yourself and trying to get value, but also having a conversation about not taking too much money. I, I don't know how that look, how'd that go? I don't know. I just took as much as I could, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I luckily I didn't get myself into a predicament where I had to get traded or, you know, I had to deal with something on that end, but, um, I know there's obviously, you know, negotiating and, and trying to figure out a trade. I didn't really have to go through that at that, at that stage. But when 2011, I had an agent and I got cut like 15 times and, you know, picked up off waivers and got, you know, picked up a check for just being picked up off waivers. And I was like, Oh, okay. Um, but from 2014, I was my own agent and, never really dealt with any issues. I just tried to hike up the price and there, I mean, there were a couple of times, you know, I just laid it out. Right. Like I was like, yeah, this is how much I'm going to receive after taxes. Boom. You know, and then, you know, this is how much you guys are offering. And it just kind of met in the middle and it was good. Luckily I got away with it. I don't know. <laughs> well, and I think that's just because at that point when you're doing it, you were doing really well and most doing most of the duties, right. Punting and kicking and stuff like that. So it's a little easier when you're, yeah, it was, yeah, exactly. And then to say, oh, wait, you want me to take a pay cut? <laughs> so, like, what, what happened with my play, you know? Uh, there was one year, probably should have taken a pay cut, but that's all right. <laughs> Nah, it, it, but it sounds like arbitration like arbitration is one of the most uncomfortable things that you hear about in pro sports justin where you sit down in a room and the team tells you why you suck because yeah. they, they don't want to have to pay you what they want when you're your own agent that's every negotiation yeah i think also too like when i got to winnipeg they just knew i was reliable accountable and they wanted that right so there was never like an issue with uh oh, your, your play is diminishing or, you know, they just knew I would figure it out, right? Like, even if I had a bad game, they knew I could figure it out. As much as maybe I was probably in my own head saying, oh, I'll probably get cut, but at the same time, um, they just knew I was reliable and accountable and I was going to figure it out. Even if I had that one bad year, they were like, oh, well, he'll figure it out next year, right? And so then, they, and then there's also the other behind-the-scenes locker room stuff, right? Um, you know, kicker being annoying, trying to get their – you know, gunners play a little harder, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but the one thing, the one thing is though, is when you don't have a kicker problem as a team, it's awesome because uh -oh. you see some of these teams, as soon as they hit that like kicker problem, they're like bouncing between a couple guys, bringing a hundred in for you. It was like, okay, yeah. How much do you want? Okay, sure. Now we don't, now we literally don't have to worry about the kicking anymore. Med, yeah. go over there, do what you need to do don't talk to us anymore. We'll yeah. worry about the other stuff kind of thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at the Winnipeg that last year, right. Yeah. I, 
they didn't really need the kicker until the last like quarter, I guess. Um, other than that, they really never needed a kicker. And I, I kind of figured, right. Like everybody's play was a little bit off last year, but maybe this year, maybe they will need it. I don't know. <laughs> Did they ever call you when they were bouncing between Legio and Mortada and all the rest where they're like, listen, dude, can you just come back for like a quarter of the season to just fix us? Yeah, they were bugging me a lot. Yeah. But I also never really announced my retirement, so that was always a little bit of the issue, right? I just kind of, oh, we didn't play football for a year and a half or whatever it might have been. So, like, I'm just kind of not going to retire. And then I also was, tra- like, you know, getting the job settled with my own situation and, you know, just, like, announcing. I just wanted to have that kind of in the back pocket, I guess. Um, and then it just, I was like, yeah, I can't do it. I talked to Osh like during camp and he was asking me questions. He called me before camp and he called me after camp. And, you know, and then they started missing some kicks and they called me again. And, <laughs> and you got the president and then you got people, you know, send me messages on LinkedIn and then Instagram. I'm like, man, chill. Somebody just go make a kick. And then, like every time somebody would miss a kick, I just get blown up. I'm like, man, <laughs> come on. Let me just relax. <laughs> Friday night, I'm having a beer. Like, <laughs> like, you want me to take a picture of my belly and send it to you guys? I'm not ready to play football. <laughs> I love the idea of you just like sitting at a cottage and you're minding your own business and your phone starts blowing up and you're like, Jesus, Mortada missed another one, I bet. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it happened. It happened like two times. They just like, they would miss and then I'd be getting blown up. It's crazy. I'd be out and about and playing golf or something and then boom. So what you're saying is you haven't officially retired yet, though. I guess I got I got to put that in, right? You're well <laughs> this is the thing when you're your own agent you can be lazy with your own retirement processing I guess. Uh but I also want to ask you because you were your own agent are you are you certified? Like are all of these contracts illegal? Should they not have been ratified by the players association <laughs> well, or what? I don't know. There's there's other people who do their own contracts. I mean Paul McCallum was the first one that kind of introduced me to it. Wow. He was doing his own contracts and, and then from there I was saying like Stala doing his own. I mean, luckily, I never really dealt with any issues. It's always hard when you have, you know, somebody, so say somebody like Andrew Harris, right? Like, I don't know if he does his own or maybe he has an agent, but, you know, to deal with that situation would be tough, right? Like you're living legend over there in Winnipeg and then your GM's trying to get you out of there and you're like, hey, you're going to need me in the playoffs, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah that's like, and luckily you didn't have to go through much of that, but that's the one thing about being your own agent is it's like, okay, if there is any like dwindling of play or if there's like a time to move on, how that yeah. would look like that would be that whole Andrew Harris thing would be weird. But yeah, and I, like yeah, those are some I tough just, conversations to have, especially like just how good and everything in Winnipeg, that would just rub me the wrong way as a player stuff. Yeah. No kidding. But hey, listen, I want to, uh, I do want to ask you now that you're uh, not retired, but kind of retired. <laughs> do you miss having like being in the locker room, training camp, that kind of stuff? Like, what do you miss about it? What don't you miss about it? Um, I don't miss, I don't know. I think, I mean, obviously, I don't know how you're doing. Like you, you retired last year. I'm, I'm right there with you, buddy. I haven't said a word. <laughs> <laughs> oh so you're back like so you're kind of staying in shape and all that like when you lose the motivation to get up and go oh man like i'm gonna get on my regimen and eat breakfast here and work out like that stuff i definitely am not doing and that's when you kind of just realize oh you're done you know um no more body by med <laughs> yeah then it just gets a little more body you're like oh dude a little more body <laughs> um I don't know. I miss like the locker room and miss playing, right? Like the the highs, you know, just being, you know, with the guys and winning. And yeah, you know, I don't miss like traveling around and going every six months. Uh, yeah. I ended on a good term, right? So there was never. Yeah. Hey, rub it in a little more, bud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember sitting there like after that game going, what else is there more to play for, you know? So it's kind of yeah. like that was it. And then. I was like, all right, I'll come back, just finish out this contract. But who knows? I'm, it just, it was a blessing in disguise, you know, as much as it sucked, you know, going through the 2020 when people couldn't play and stuff like that. And then at the same time, uh, to end it like that was rough, but it was probably the greatest thing that happened to me, you know, professionally as a 
you know, transitioning into the next phase of my life. So. Yeah. And it, it kind of seems like you got out. I don't want to say at the right time because obviously you'd still be playing and stuff like that, even if you wanted to, but the way the global stuff is going right now with the kickers, right? Like you were kind of the last, the last Mohican that was doing everything as an American too. Yep. You know what I mean? Like now yeah. it's kind of like, okay, is it going to be a global? Is it going to be a Canadian? Is it going to be one yeah. each? Like there's, it's just such a mess with the kicking world right now Yeah. because like, look at the global draft, man. Yeah. I mean, this is a, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the global thing, so I can be straight up honest about it. I, I think it's a, uh, it's just bad for the game. I mean, it's bad for all the, you know, when people talk about the ratio, right? Like go back to the ratio and people have those opinions on that. It's still Canadian is so good for the game. And the ratio is important because it gives hope for some of the, the younger generation. Right. And so the CIS kids have this like aspiration to play, you know, safety or play wide receiver. And so if you take away that ratio, right. Um, and I'm for the American too. Right. So it's just, but you take away the, uh, the ratio, then you dwindle it down to five that loses more hope for some of those players. So take that for example. And then you, you know, the punters, right. They're like toast. They're never playing in the, you know, they're never playing in the CFL. Like that's, that's done all the global. I mean, there's more globals going around now compared to my last year I played, we were getting a couple, you know, that weren't really ready to play. And then all of a sudden now they're going like all over the place, getting Australians, because before it was just what uh, some Europeans and uh, and Mexicans, well, right? Yeah, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, Justin, because I like the idea of like the global program is bad. I actually disagree with. I think uh-huh. the I think the way that the personnel people for the majority of CFL teams have embraced, quote unquote, embraced the global program is lazy, and that's why it's bad. Because they the easiest thing you can possibly do if you want to go out and get a global player is, hey, Aussie Rules football guys, they're kind of tough. They're a little bit yeah. bigger. They've been playing NCAA football. We can get them, and they can just kick it a quarter mile there. I don't have to think. I don't have to scale it. I don't have to go out and put the effort in to find a lineman or a linebacker. or a. Whereas if you hit a Theodric Hansen, you can hit a home run. Yeah. Like if you actually oh, yeah. go out and find those different positional players. But I think every year when we look at the global draft, and it's punter, 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 punter linebacker, punter, 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 linebacker, punter, punter, running back, receiver, punter, punter. Like when I see that, to me – they're drafting for depth. Like Hamilton took like two or three punters. Uh, Edmonton, I think, took three specialists all in that. And I'm like, that's not well, because at that's the end of the, the day, too. They, you know, you look at the position players that they had in the global right. draft. There wasn't, I mean, they were, they were just weren't as polished, right? right. Compared to uh, just grab, you know, drafting like two or three punters, you're going to grab one and one of them's going to play, probably yeah. play for a couple of years. Some of these other ones will never play. It like may not even get on the field on special teams. Now, you know, you know, Hanson was different, right? That's a different breed, and maybe yeah. they're getting a little bit more. That was more of the trial, but you know, they do need to implement it somewhere else because that's just killed all CIS punters' hope. Like they're not going to be playing, and kickers probably are on the next way, yeah. right? So, yeah, I just, I guess, my point on it would be that I don't think that the way that CFL teams are using the global is what's best for the game. It's just what's the easiest way to get in, get out, use the allocation that they have to make, and then move forward with what they think will really change their roster. But like you say, if you're just throwing guys in there at special teams roles, and special teams is such a huge part of our game, it's obviously going to have a detrimental effect on the overall quality of the game. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if the the talent is going to be as strong too. I, I honestly don't think. I mean, yeah, the guy from Calgary is pretty good, yep. but. I don't know. I haven't really seen anybody that's taking over. It's a and lot that's, of that's the same with the the skill guys too. It's the exact same, right? You talked about the Theodric Hansen guys, but that's it's the one out of uh, you know how many drafts have there been now? Yeah, right. It's one guy, and like you said with the Calgary punter, one guy. But mm-hmm. it's okay. I have to dress two of these global players, so they're going to be kickers, right? Mm-hmm. And then one will be a special teams guy that runs down. So now all you're saying is, well, I'm going to bring in a thousand global kickers to camp and we'll pick the best one there and not even look at an American guy, not even look at a Canadian guy, because that's, that's what I have to do. And I'm not going to waste a roster spot. And you're right, man, because it's, you know, they're talking about dwindling down this Canadian ratio. Then yeah. like, Well, how can we get a couple more globals in there? Right. And yeah. it just, 
it right now at the time that it's at in March, maybe you're right too with the laziness part of it, but it's just the skill. It's a weird dynamic of, okay, let's get a little less Canadians out because put the best product on the field, but let's keep this global thing going, but they're just not polished yet. Right. We'll find a couple in the, you know, in the reeds or in the weeds, wherever we find them. Right. But you can see now it's, it, I mean, every kid, I think the kicker's situation is even more of a disaster. I think every time they put a kicker out there, it's been pretty bad performance. Uh, punter has been okay. Like, okay. Like get to buy, but you know, you can fake the, you can fake the punting. I've done that for well, <laughs> 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 just make a couple more field goals and you're good to go. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say like the idea of faking the punting, um, <laughs> I don't know, Justin. I was at the first Tie Cats preseason game, and there were three dudes in there who were trying to fake the punting, and it it was bad, dude. I don't know. I faked it. I faked it for for a few years, and then Ryan Bolt lit me up, and it was like after a couple of that, a couple of those sessions, I was like, all right, let me take my punting a little bit more serious. <laughs> well, and it's funny though, man, because you were the first person with that, like when I was in camp, <laughs> you would get absolutely lit up. Like, <laughs> Day oh, in and day out, Medlock would get lit up. And you, for you were there for like, 2014, right? Yeah. Okay, yep. that was the worst. I mean, I was the worst player on the team. I was like, I remember the, I remember the time we went. I went five for five, and like we won. We beat BC. It was like I don't know. It was like something like 21 or 22 to like 17, something like you know where the field goals mattered, right? And they were doing like the stars of the game and they're like doing the top three and they go third and then they go, then they go second and then they go first. And everybody's like, good luck, good luck. <laughs> and they're like, boom, like read. And I'm like, oh, shoot, here we go. <laughs> He's like, all right, play those next clips. Let's go. We're going to watch these film. I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> and they had like a horrible game, average like 33 yards on punt. It's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> But it's it's funny, man, because you were the first person that I saw get lit up consistently like that. But the cool thing about it is you were always kind of you'd go back to the locker room and you were the first person that I would be like would be laughing and joking with all the guys, you know what I mean? And yeah, I, I think it, it was nice. It was nice because you would go back to the locker room and you'd be having a good time. So people were like, Oh, okay, like I guess it's not that bad if that happens to me. Like yeah, you maybe externally, I mean internally, I was like <laughs> Gosh, I suck. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, re I remember Paul Osbaldison <laughs> coming up to me at a CFL draft that we were doing. This was late in your time with the Thai Cats, and I asked him something about special teams. You know, hey, how do you think the unit's going to look going into this year? He's like, if Ryan Bolt doesn't start being nicer to Justin, I'm going to have to say something. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was like, oh, I don't think you're going to say anything. <laughs> Dude, yeah, it was like it was like Bartel was the first one that got it got it bad, and then. I got it bad. And then after that, they, he kind of loosened up, but it was for the better. Right. Uh, it was just different. Right. So I think he probably just dropped it in on me. And then after that, he kind of was chill. What's the, he, yeah, was, he definitely, he got the best out of people. That's for sure. And he was good at what he did. Clearly was good at what he did. Got the best of people. But I, I had, a, thing, I had a coach, uh, Eric B enemy. And I remember talking to him in college, and he was my uh, special teams. So he's my kickoff coverage guy. And I was like, "Hey, why don't you yell at me?" And he's like, "Oh, kickers are fragile. Like we don't mess with you. Like you good. You just will cover it." And I always thought to myself, "Man, he's actually right because we are kind of fragile." And Rival would do the complete opposite, just like rip the kicker. It didn't even matter what the other people did on the team. They would. He. It was like always Medlock's fault. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah, good. You're right. It's <laughs> Medlock. <laughs> Get the yeah, I mean, ball better, Med, and maybe I won't miss the tackle on the cover yeah. team, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, hey, now, is that why you wore headphones in the game? Oh, is that why you wore little earplugs so that you oh, can hear getting, people yelling? Yeah, I remember. Because what happened was we started playing the Toronto Argos, and Slazy Waters was like MVP of the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dropping balls at the one yard line, and then I was over there like dinking it into the wind because this is the first time we played in the windy stadium. Ball was going up and coming backwards. Nobody's seen it, and then they're all yelling at me. They're like, "Man, I'll kick the ball." I'm like, "We this is our first game in the stadium. I've never played here. Like, we're kicking straight into the wind. It's going backwards." And then uh, after that, I was like, "I'm putting the headphones on. I'm getting it from Rainbow. I'm getting it from everybody on the team." So I just put headphones. I mean, uh, earplugs on and. 
Oh, so yeah. you didn't – that was the first time you wore them in that, Hamilton? After that game. It was the first time. We played against Toronto, and I was, like, getting yelled – I was, like, getting yelled at by the, the fans, and I was getting yelled at by the teammate, uh, teammates. I remember – what was his name? The 38, uh, Mar, 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 Oh, uh, Marcellus. yeah. Marcellus Bowman. Yeah, Bowman. And then he was coming like, come on, man, kick the ball. And this Stu came up to me. He's like, come on, man, kick the ball. I'm like – I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying, man. Like, I'm trying. And then, remember, it was like 410, like, towards ACL in the game. And then they threw yeah. a Miller. Miller was throwing lobs. Like, oh, man, that game. That so, for those for those that don't know, Med literally had the construction earpieces that you'd, like, fold and roll up. Yeah. Stick them in your ear. And he'd wear those all the time. And you'd talk to him. I, there was probably, yeah. I probably went that whole year not knowing you were wearing headphones or earphones. So I would like, how, how long did you wear those for? From that point on, 2014, I wore them ever since. But I wish I would have worn them in, uh, in my NFL days. I just wish I would have done that. Because there were some people in the NFL, John Carney, um, Steve Weatherford wore uh, earplugs. I wish I would have done it because it was just like, game changer i was just kind of in my own zone i can still hear everything but not to that like extent it, it just muted or muddled it so you didn't have to deal with the sports psychology of just constantly getting screamed at like in a clear way yeah in a clear way like i remember calgary game uh remember when tasker dropped that 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 hold and we lost the game yeah. uh yeah that was super loud and like ever, ever since then like i was wearing earplugs and never really heard it too much wow. Yeah, it's I, I mean, cool kickers should do it. I mean, I think so, but. And it's funny, too, because you'd see them all game. Like, you know, you med would joke around the locker room, joke around with everybody, be kind of like the life of the party in the locker room. But then you get out to game and have the earplugs in. And I don't think you said a word to anybody. Yeah, you I don't. talk to anybody all game? No. I mean, it's so weird because, you know, you look at, like, Sean White and you look at me, like, complete opposites, right? Like, he's just chill, you know, having fun out there. And then. You know, I'm over there, like, serious, focused, like, the whole time. Uh, so it's just different. Everybody's a little different. And then look at McCallum. He was really chill, too. I, I mean, I just could never get that relaxed. I wish I could, but, yeah. Well, that's because you were dealing, like you said, with the wind in Hamilton and everyone yeah. yelling at you clearly from the sideline. And, the and then you go, to, then you go to Winnipeg. At med. <laughs> yeah, you go to Winnipeg. You're, like, 20 for 20, and you miss a kick, and then they're yelling at you. So. <laughs> 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 what's uh what's the biggest difference between Reinbold and O'Shea in terms of how they uh, approach specials as a as a game? Not necessarily the screaming at you, but in terms of how they they approach the specials game. Oh, they're a complete opposite. Yeah, <laughs> O'Shea. I mean, awesome. I mean, I love Ryan. Reinbold was awesome. It's just a different style, right? Like he gets his guys going, which I think that's why they can play with a lot of people on special teams uh, because they bring the the attitude, the you know, the effort into the games. Uh, Osh was just different, smarter. Um, he was one of those guys that just kind of, whenever I was down, he'd pick me up. And whenever I was up, like, he'd kind of put me in my place. So, uh, <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're not shit. <laughs> or, sorry, you're not stuff. <laughs> so, That's so. funny, man. Hey, well, listen, I want to I wanna thank you for coming on here, but I want to finish with this. Are you the worst golfer in your house still? <laughs> I don't know. My, my, uh, my son, he's getting pretty good. Um, yeah, I probably can beat my. Uh, I could probably beat my wife. I don't. I don't no, not really. Uh, no, you yeah. can't. <laughs> it's a good game. Sometimes <laughs> I do. Sometimes, but it's like very rare. And sometimes she just, yeah, I lose. Because your son, okay. your son. I listen. I don't. I don't see a lot of the little kids golf, but your yeah. son is lights out. Like he's hitting that thing off the tee cleaner than probably Marsh and I both oh, combined. He could I'm... probably beat him and I in a scramble. Yeah, and he's I, pretty I, good. He's going to be complete, competing with Charlie Woods, isn't he? Yeah, it's just about, I mean, it's, you know, he's five years old, so sometimes you just have to realize he can't really focus, right? Uh, but he's good. He's solid. Um, I don't know. It's weird. You know, as a kid, you know, when you're young, you, you're just like, I want to go outside the backyard and play. Yeah. He's, still, he's like, man, backyard's like downstairs. I don't want to go out there and play. I'm like, let's, let's get out there and play. Let's grind. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know. I'm uh, I'm struggling with that part, but he's good. I mean, we just have fun as long as you make it fun. When did yeah, you man. first put the club in his hand? Uh, early on, we yeah. just kind of hit balls. We, you know, when he was young and I was playing uh, football, just take him to the field. He'd have the club and have the ball and just hit. 
and then he started getting pretty decent. Um, but when I'm thinking about signing him up for a uh, little U S kids, um, for two tournaments, just to get him introduced for, uh, this summer. And then once he kind of picks that up and he starts playing a little bit better then we can play a little bit more in the spring and winter. And then, and then we have U uh, U S worlds. And, uh, you, like, can you go? <laughs> <laughs> and, then we, and then we have, and we got the masters and, and then we'll conquer the planet together. <laughs> one step at a time. Uh, did My you retirement is set up? I have yeah. to ask, did you, Justin, watch the Tiger Woods HBO documentary that went so in-depth on his dad's relationship with getting him into golf? Because I found that to be incredibly intriguing. Oh, uh, yeah, I saw the first one. I didn't see – well, actually, yeah, I did, I did see both. Um, yeah, I mean, he was – he was a stud, so. Here we go. Yeah, Charlie – I mean, that you know, he also had the get, too, right? Like the, the – you know, to be good, right? I mean, we'll see how Charlie is. Charlie's really good, has all the resources, but you can never train somebody like mentally. Right. Well, unless you throw them into Navy SEAL training and then, uh, you know, makes them lose their mind like Tiger did for a little while there. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, and I guess, I guess kicking's a lot like golf in any way, right? Like it's just so precise oh. anyway. So that's probably why you keep going with it. But yeah, we had some good little matches out there, you know, over in uh, Hamilton when we were there. It was cool. Yeah, it was fun, man. It was fun. But listen, I want to, I want to appreciate, I appreciate you coming on. I want to say thanks for taking your time. Cause I know you're on West coast time. So you're just, you're chilling right now, but I want to yeah. say thanks for coming on. Hopefully we'll see you kicking sometime this year. Oh, kicking a couple yeah. of goals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if they have a Jersey big enough for me. Right? <laughs> a little more body there. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger body bags now for you. <laughs> Uh, no, that's cool. I'm glad. Uh, thanks for having me. It was cool.